What is the first image that appears in your mind when you think of Somalia? Do you see a drought enveloped land with nomads and camels walking towards the scorching out sun? Maybe a city laid in waste with the ruins of yesteryear filled with the bullets and blasphemy of today? Citizens are living in fear of the possible threats of lurking terrorists when in a car of their own. Perhaps you also see a shattered capital with pirates carrying acres in their low-grade boats, attacking ships, trying to get anything from which they can. Warlords leading their army men to attack and strike fear to citizens so that they may further establish political dominance. Or do you see a nation rich in both culture and history? Cities once vibrant with music and art. The streets filled with citizens, all having somewhere to go, whether it be work, school, or even to gather with friends and associates. A nation with a capital that showed immense promise with the growing progress it presented through its well-developed education, radical shift to scientific socialism, a strengthening economy, all under the rule of Siad Barre. To see it as such now only raises more questions. Why is such a strong republic once considered the most beautiful nation in Africa, destined for greatness, with the influences of superpowers such as the United States and Soviet Union, turned into a terror-riddled shell of its former self? What led to its devastating downfall and current political standstill? Why has the land of my parents and theirs, once a land of untold beauty, lost the test of time become a nation stagnant? Before finding the various solutions to the current underlying problems Somalia has, mainly within its capital Mogadishu, it's best to understand its upbringing as a broken and failed nation through the wide-reaching history it has to not only appreciate the richness of it, but to pinpoint the causes and red flags. Looking past the scramble for Africa and the gruesome civil war fought, Somali history ranges back to the early centuries and even a time before history with noteworthy records and historical landmarks such as the Last Gale. Located in Somaliland, the Last Gale, meaning the Camel's Well, is one of the oldest cave paintings in Africa, dating back to as early as 9000 BC. The paintings depict cows, antelopes, hunters, and even giraffes, drawn in a style some have called Ethiopian Arabic. Its true meaning remains unknown, but it can be seen as a tribute to the animals. The last gale is an important piece of Somali history, and one of the earliest signs of Somali activity within the Horn of Africa, just as important as the land of Punt and the Azure Empire. Jumping from 9000 to the mid-2000 BCs, only a couple of centuries before the various sultans, such as the Algerian clan, had staked during the medieval times, Somalia wasn't quite Somalia. Rather, it's theorized through ancient Egyptian inscriptions that it was a part of an ancient trading kingdom called the Land of Punt, which was partnered with Egypt. Many of the traders had traded with Indians and even the Chinese for items such as herbs, gold, and ivory. This was an early sign that Somalia was going to be accustomed to trading, as we discovered further on due to the nature of their unique coastal line that it made it easier for travelers to come and trade. It was through the Land of Punt that Somalia had started to develop a more connected trading system with giants such as Greece and the Roman Empire, including many more. Later on in the Somali timeline, starting around the 6th century, we could see Persian and Arab traders arrive to the coastal lines, which were far more hospitable than the Arab Baghdads in the interior, as they began to spread the religion of Islam as Somali started pushing southwards away from the coast of Adin. Somali history remains quiet for the next thousand of years, but with recorded history entering the early centuries, it leads us into Somalia's first golden age, the Age of the Algerian. The Algerian Empire developed to be the largest sultanate occupying the Great Horn of Africa at a time where the Oriental Republic was the worst Senegalese sultanate over at the northeastern end. More of a tax-based admin system, it would be succeeded by British Somaliland down the line. The Algerian Empire was a trading kingdom much like the land of Punt, but rather a hydraulic-based empire who had a monopoly on their over-access to various water resources, many of them being a part of the Jubais River. There were various port cities such as Barwa, Marka, and most noteworthy Mokodisho that despite not being as powerful as the trading kingdom as previous years, they did attract the empire from setting up trade within the rest of Africa and even the rest of the world. The Algerian Empire had connections to many other nations. Their ships went to as far as China with whom they traded incense with, and strangely enough, giraffes. Mokodisho, just like Somalia as a whole, entered a golden age as Imozidi Arabs migrated. The capital had many rich merchants, had strong relations with the Algerian Sultanate, was minting its own currency, had a monopoly with gold trade, and if you can see the castles and fortresses scattered throughout southern Somalia today, it was due to the architectures in medieval Mogadishu. Their involvement with the rest of the world stemmed even past simple trading. Thanks to the house of the Garen royal family, 
They have formed strong well-earned alliances that would help the people of medieval Mogadishu stay in the golden age. As the Austrian Empire was reaching its zenith, Europe had begun to enter its age of discovery. Through the vast seas, Portugal had begun to launch sea expeditions to discover new land and new sources for material. Tristan da Cunha, naval commander and explorer, led these attacks in the hope of acquiring land from the Algerian. His attempts would remain in vain as despite managing to loot the towns and burn many of them down, the people revolted against him and drove him and his men away. Algerian would see another unsuccessful attack from other naval commanders, with one of them being known as Joao do Sepulveda, who had launched constant harassment overseas, sometimes after Tristado, only this time the Algerian had allied themselves with the Ottoman Empire, whom they had both strong trade and military relations with. As a side note, the Ottoman Empire would dissolve sometime later and become today's Republic of Turkey, who are still wonderful allies of Somalia. So much so that they've established what is still considered the biggest Turkey embassy within Mogadishu. They've invested a lot of resources to help Somalia with their education and even have a massive military training unit that is currently training Somali soldiers. Back to the Austrian Empire, we can see them leave the heights of the Golden Age and into a recession which would ultimately lead them to their dissolvement. There would be many different reasons as to why the Austrian Empire had to dissolve. There would also be heavy taxing that angered many of the citizens. Coupled this with the already established struggles the Algerian Empire was facing, it would seem like destiny that they met their demise near the end of the 17th century. The Gabrun dynasty, also known as the Sultanate of the Gilidi, wasn't a short-lived occurrence. Rather, it was a successor to the Algerian Empire and Sultanate of Mogadishu. The Gabrun dynasty's lifespan matched that of the Algerian and would even manage to enter the 20th century. The history isn't as vast as the Algerian, but the leaders give us a better insight mainly with Yusuf Mahmoud Ibrahim and Osman Ahmed. The Gabun dynasty didn't have much power as their predecessors, but it was through the 20-year rule of Yusuf that marked the better years of the Sultanate. The rule of Yusuf went on for nearly half a decade. He had reinvigorated the ivory trade in the east that allowed for the empire to regain stability in their main source of income by putting it into the first Somali Jihad, the Bardre. It was also through Yusuf that we saw strong relation between the Gabun dynasty and the Sultanate of Yemen and Oman, both of which are still going on in the 21st century. The Gabun dynasty had also been going on for more than two centuries and the power given to the rulers had greatly decreased, which didn't help with the fact that Osman wasn't as loved nor as known as the previous rulers. The only noteworthy achievement Osman had was that he signed a couple of treaties with the Italians for the proctorate of his possession of territories he had controlled only to die two years after. Due to such the reign of the Gabun dynasty ended and only to be succeeded by Italy's establishment of a colony within a good portion of Somalia. This didn't come out of nowhere however as Italy's slow takeover had been developing years before Osman's death. The scramble for Africa was raging on as the Gabrun dynasty was slowly dying out. Even the neighboring empires, Somali Mauritian Sultanate and the Sultanate of Hobyo had already been given to Italy. Within the late 19th century, we would only see a few places be colonized, but come as early as the 20th century and nearly every European country had stakes throughout all of Africa, especially Somalia. The economy Italy had at the time wasn't the greatest, nor their capital. Their need for resources and a way to support their citizens had pushed them to look into colonizing other smaller countries for whatever they had and whatever they could take to benefit themselves. The ports Somalia had were also a very important reason for Italy to colonize them as it provided to be a great strategy for other trade routes. Britain and even France had been involved in the colonization of Africa with them taking only some parts of Somalia when compared to Italy. When the first world war had occurred, Britain and Italy considered each other allies. Britain had even gave parts of South Somalia to Italy. However, when the next world war started, things changed for the worse and we could see Italy try to invade Britain's territory only to fail and retreat. It is also worthy to note that it was through Britain's occupation of Somalia that allowed for the rise of political parties such as the Somali Youth League, previously known as the Somali Youth Club, which was also the first Somali political party. The idea of independence wasn't too far-fetched for the Somali citizens as it would only develop through these parties that would allow this idea to fester, grow, and be known to the rest of the world. And known to the world it would be as with some time later, we could see the United Nations come in and intervene. It would be established that Italy wouldn't entirely be a colonizer, rather a trustee that would now go by the trust territory of Somalia. Somalia and Mogadishu would start to see better development for themselves as we could see education begin to become more widespread with the quality increasing as it became free and more accessible. Mogadishu and some parts of Somalia would see the infrastructure become more beautiful. It was given a 10-year wait for Somalia to officially be independent from other entities controlling their development. What was once Italian Somaliland, now the trust territory of Somalia and former British Somali land, will unite to form the Republic of Somalia. Now with its independence, Somalia and its official capital of Mogadishu was now its own true legal nation, which would mean that it would need its own functioning body of government. Through the members of the trustee, Mahmoud Ibrahim Igal and Abdullahi Issa Muhammad, the government would start to see some new growth. 
A new constitution with the people's involvement would be drafted after establishing Adin Abdullahi Osman Dar as president and Abdul Rashid Ali Sharmaki as prime minister. The Somali Republic was the president to what is now considered the golden age for modern Somalia. It was very short lived, only having around nine years to its run and only three presidents. Within the Somali Republic, there was a lot of Western influence when creating the constitution and developing the government body. Somali politics at the time was a lot more inclusive. It avoided the usage of clans and profession when engaging in such as that would have divided the people. Rather, all men could vote with their God-given right to freedom of expression and now suffrage would be expanded to women, which would give the majority of society the privilege to engage in the country's affairs. Many of which were very inclined to do so, especially with the introduction of radios to the mass public. The issue of unifying all Somali territories into one nation was a topic of debate for a very long time, and we could see it reach a sort of resolution, as efforts were made by the government to do so. Times were good during this era of Somalia, but things would change drastically soon. The second and last president, Abdul Rashid Ali Sharmake, had been spending the day visiting La Sanon over in the north to get to know the locals. During this visit, his bodyguard took the opportunity to assassinate him. This wasn't just a rogue mercenary, rather this was a part of a grander scheme that was led by Siad Barre, former major general and commander in chief. It didn't take long for the power vacuum to be shut as only a few days after the funeral of the late president, Barre and his team had launched a coup d'etat and seized power of the republic. Barre was now allowed to lead the nation with his own vision, not through a cruel tyranny but a powerful leadership that would bring Somalia to a greater level. He abolished the constitution, outlawed political parties, threw former politicians who engaged with the past government in jail, got rid of the parliament, and had dubbed this new nation the Somali Democratic Republic. Somalia had went through a very swift and drastic change, for better or worse. Barre had no need for multiple parties as it would only money the discourse and advancement of the nation with division and bickering. Rather, he established a Marxist-Leninist, one-party totalitarian military dictatorship. We had begun to stop any form of private trading or forms of capitalism and would bring much of our economy under the state's control. The change we had seen through the old republic was a lot slower and calmer, allowing for a more natural progression of our society. In contrast, Barry would have a more idealistic view of his nation. We could see this fast switch for the economy and body of government and we do the same for nearly everything else. For our education, he had helped establish the first written form of the Somali language. This would be pushed for the various schools on top of a new literacy program that the government had pushed very hard and rather too quickly. Avoiding the harsh reality of the administration team and how they came to be in control, this would truly be a wonderful time for the Somali citizens. Education, though rushed, did indeed help much of the youth. Our literacy rates were at an all-time high as students were not better taught to understand their books and materials. Many citizens were active and working through the new jobs being introduced to the country. The previous republic had tried to be a lot more inclusive, but it took a great amount of time. However, with Bahrain, diversity and rights for all groups was his major goal as he wanted to unite the nation and abandon the past of separation of both land and people. Industries would be set up all throughout Mogadishu while under Bahrain's rule. Somalia's economy, with the influence of scientific socialism, the rapid growth of the industries, new factories and farming programs, would be at its all-time highest state during this crucial period of its growth. In turn, the USSR, a leading superpower who was engaged in an ideological battle with America, brought about the Cold War, would try to get the chance to establish a relationship with this growing African nation. For the USSR, it was vital for them to lend a hand towards Somalia as a strategic counter against America. With the assistance of Moscow, it enabled Somalia to have the largest army within that region of Africa and would further establish their dominance. It would be well known that Somalia was a leading powerhouse within Africa, but it would also be known as one of the most beautiful, progressive, and culturally rich nations. Knowing that Somalia was at a period of rapid growth, with working citizens that could rely on the stable economy, this would allow many to begin to take Somalia's cultures to new heights, as Somalia was not only going to a democratic and economic revival, but a cultural one too. Many aspects of Somalia were becoming modernized, all in an attempt to create a greater nation. Through various art and culture programs, Bahrain would be investing heavily to make the capital of Mogadishu a hotspot for rich Somali art. Musicians that would later define Somalian music would become known to this era. Singers such as Maria Morsel, who would also be known as the first female Somali taxi driver and would stun crowds with her beautiful jazz music. Sado Ali was an influential singer too, with hits such as Unabi. Also Ahmed Naji, who sang Ahdigan. Different bands would also rise from this era too, each with their own style. 
The Dur Dur band was incredibly popular during their height, with western influences such as Michael Jackson and would become a staple in Somali pop culture. Theater was also very big in this era, with many watching famous plays within the always packed Somali national theater. It seems as though the investment that Barre made with reinvigorating his nation's culture was a great move on his part. The greater vision for Somalia was slowly decaying as Barre had too much set out for himself. For greater Somalia to truly flourish, he launched a campaign with his massive army to try and take over some parts of Ethiopia, mainly Ugadan, to expand the rule of a nation he knew was destined for greatness. Ethiopia was going through a dark period of riots and soon a government takeover that would switch the nation to one that supported communism. This would leave the powerful support of America in a rough spot, which goes equally for the Soviets. The USSR was approached with a partnership with Ethiopia, but they couldn't support two nations with bad blood. Barre was asked to be peaceful with Ethiopia and to stop pushing towards their land, but with the greater Somalia so close to becoming a reality, he had to decline a continuous campaign missions. This would leave Somalia without an ally who was as powerful and as involved as the Soviets. However, we did see America come into support, but it seemed too hard for him to commit at the time of the Cold War. Somalia would start to enter a harsh economic recession, which was coupled with a cruel famine. The government would grow to become more totalitarian, silencing anybody who would go against them under the paranoia that another coup would emerge. This chain of bad events would still go on. Bure would be involved in a horrible accident, leaving him in critical condition, which would turn power over to his right hand man. The people would grow increasingly disgruntled with their government. When Bure came back, it made it no better. Political pressure was getting more and more tense. The Ugandan campaign's failure would remind Bure of what could have been for Somalia. The Cold War was drawing to a close as the USSR had dissolved, leaving the US with no need for Somalia as a strategic pawn. During this period of Somalia, many different militant groups would rise and begin to willingly go against Bure's administration. His country had been going through the toughest period, but this weight would be enough to cause the collapse of the Somali Democratic Republic. The economy had now completely crashed, food was scarce and they would no longer have a strong leader as Bure would now be removed from office and flee due to the militant groups who had now begun the civil war would overtake his nation. The civil war would further cripple Somalia, leaving it in ruins. It had left more than half a million dead and a million more displaced all throughout the globe. Somalia had also lost most of its stakes within their sea and fishing as other nations had came in to sweep in their available resources. Somalia had been to a rough place time and time again throughout history, but its education seems to be the last investment needed for a brighter future. But they don't have much to work with. Not enough funding for learning materials, nor for better education, for what many consider to be of low quality. Hopefully one day Somalia can return to its former glory, because it has been made obvious to me that it absolutely can.